So I, I'm Martin Dawes. I am a family physician, although I'm just holding on. Um, I did 17 years of, of full practice. Um, and then got, I, I was really excited by research um, as a resident, um, as a full-time family doc, now as an academic. And what I'm really doing here is showing how research is important to primary care using five examples, not seven, I think I put up there. I'm going to try and run through them. Uh, there are four slides on each research project. There are different topics. Uh, this is research that was done in primary care by family physicians and other people working in primary care, uh, presented at something called North American Primary Care Research Group meeting, which is the largest primary care research meeting in the world. It, it happens, it's between Canada and the United States. We flip-flop between the two. Um, uh, my bias, um, my disclosure is I'm actually the program chair of that meeting. Um, so that's partly why we're promoting it. We did this a couple of years ago um, and it seemed to work and then we took it to FMF and, and they had to get the fire marshals to clear the room because there were too many people. So we thought, right, instead of just making it FMF, let's take it around a bit. So that's why I'm here. Um, it also, I hope, will help you realize the importance of, of saying yes when we say, could you help us with a research project? So I, I do have a, a couple of reasons for, for doing this. Um, does that work? How do I do this? That way. So each of these have been summarized. Um, one slide says, what's the question? Why did they do it? Second is, what did they do? Third is, what they found? And fourth is, why is this important to you? So th that's why we're calling it nuggets, basically. Um, so, first question, straight into it. Uh, the, the second bit there is it's been published. He presented it in uh, 2013, it's Mark Ebel. Uh, how long does cough last? Sorry? 18 days. All right, you don't need it. Um, however, it's very nice to know that you're correct and that this is based on evidence. Um, so, most patients diagnosed with acute bronchitis, which is actually a decision a diagnosis decided on when we give an antibiotic to a patient rather than any sort of pathological thing. But um, uh, many patients believe that antibiotics are effective. What's the reason for this? So they went to, f to nearly 500 Georgia residents um, and um, six vignettes, um, fever, no fever, phlegm, green, no phlegm, green phlegm, yellow phlegm. It's, it's quite really attractive. Um, <laughs> very colorful, um, and then they asked them how long they thought it would last from beginning to end and what they thought about antibiotics. Um, to, to sort of position this with the world literature, they actually did a systematic review of all trials looking at duration of cough, so they could actually come back with some evidence to compare what, what was happening. Um, so, you're wrong by point two. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, but that's fine. So. <laughs> Duration of cough in the published literature is 18 days. Um, just going away with that is incredibly strong. When I get residents in, and because and we're a teaching clinic, we have a lot of them, and, and I just ask, you know, they come back, oh, patients had a cough for seven days, you know, I'm thinking about giving antibiotics. I say, really? How long does the cough last for? And they say 10 days, nine days. They rarely say 18 days. Um, maybe it's our residents, but... Um, so, the uh, respondents said a mean to five to seven days. Uh, you ask medical students, they'll be talking about 10 days. The brighter ones will be saying 18 days, but the less educated will be saying 10 days. Um, the patients who expected a longer duration of illness were more likely to be white, female, and have self-reported asthma or chronic lung disease, the ones who have actually been through a bit. Uh, independence of predictors of belief that antibiotics are helpful, uh, non-white race, uh, some college educational less, so less well-educated, and previous antibiotics. So by giving antibiotics, we increase the cycle of belief that antibiotics help, um, and we're making it worse for ourselves. So last slide. So I'm giving you a whole talk that usually would take half an hour in four. I am cutting it down a bit. Um, patients believe that acute bronchitis should last about a week. Uh, that explains why they come to you and ask for antibiotics. And we need to do something about that. So there are plenty of trials that I'm not talking about which talk about um, how to stop this cycle. 
there was one actually presented, it was a nugget from last year, that if you do an educational program um, for your patients, if you have posters on the wall and you explain to them and you have leaflets, you can cut down that expectation. The bad news is when they come into your office and say, I want an antibiotic, 70% of the time you'll say yes and 50% of the time you'll think it's not indicated. Um, so we do have to do something outside the immediacy of the office because you're into that, I'm going to see 10 patients in the next hour scenario um, and you've just got to get through. And unless you're in one of those long clinics where you've given 30 to 40 minutes, it's really difficult to do that educational piece. So, so put it outside the immediate part of your clinical office, put it in the waiting room, do the education out there, do it in the community, because that's where it works. So, uh, next question. E. coli, uh, resistance. And this is really a message, uh, the bottom line here is go and find out what your patients are resistant to before you carry on giving antibiotics. I'm not suggesting you don't give antibiotics in this case. Um, so they wanted to know, um, University of Toronto, um, what is the resistance rates? Uh, are they changing over time? Um, uh, and what are we doing with our quinolones? Um, so they contacted a few GPs across Canada. Um, so 15,742, of whom 330 said yes. So there's a point there about it would have been nice if 15,000 of those 15,742 had said yes, um, because then the data would have been stronger. Uh, or you can go and do it in your own practice. So it's cross-sectional observational design. So now, today, what's it like, uh, rather than looking forward at all? And they compared trimethoprim, sulfamethasol, cipro, nitro, uh, nationally, region, regionally, and by clinical factors. And they compared it with a 2002 study that was published. Um, so it's gone from 11% to 16% for trimethoprim, sulfur uh, resistance, without actually a regional variation. That's a trend. Um, there isn't significance in that. Um, because we didn't have the 15,000 GPs we should have, or they should have got. Um, it was 21% in resistance to trimethoprim um, sulfur was, uh, or septra, I guess I should call it, uh, in premenopausal women compared to 11% in women greater than 50 years old. Uh, interesting. Cipro resistance has increased from 1.1% to 5.5% in the seven years. Um, and Cipro resistance here is just under 20%, which is scary, because that's mostly of our second-line treatment. I mean, we have nitro as well, and there, there are others. But, but that's, that's really worrying here. The good news is nitro was low. Now, what I don't know for this study is exactly where they got their lab forms from. Because if I said to myself, what's your E. coli resistance rate, Martin, in your practice? I would go to my lab records, I would get out all the E. coli's, um, and I would look through. Now, probably, I don't know, guesstimating, 20% of those patients might have had a recent uh, hospitalization. We've got a slightly elderly demographic. Um, and I don't know whether those reports were from an ambulatory clinic in the hospital, or whether they were a, my request for an ambulatory patient in my practice who was not going to the hospital. Uh, so I think we have to be a little careful, because this may contain some of those patients who are recently hospitalized um, and slightly atypical, not the 21-year-old girl who's come in and having her third urinary tract infection in the last 10 years. Um, so we have to be slightly careful. Um, but. This, this is bad news for us. If it's happening in the Kootenays as well, you, you need to be aware of that. And the only way you're going to know is if you go and look at your own resistance rates in your practice um, and actually physically do this. You'll get main pro C until you co it comes out of your ears if you do that, uh, except it won't be called main pro C anymore because um, it's... What is it going to be called? I've forgotten now. I don't know about the new name. I think it's no. just main pro. It's going to be called main, main, main pro? Boring should call it the Kootenai. Um, so, and you have something you can go back to now, nitro, if you want. Um, 
So what's it mean? Um, it, resistance is really important. Um, you know, infectious diseases is, is so significant. And in terms of the future, it, in, in terms of what diseases we can actually cure, um, uh, well, we may be able to actually prevent diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease in the future by switching people's RNA a bit. Um, but I'm not sure we can actually deal with infections so effectively. Uh, so this is scary. Uh, you should look at, at your resistance rates um, and think about strategically what you're going to do in your practices. Um, and maybe you don't need to treat every UTI that isn't actually an infection. Um, Good. So uh, this is a more interesting one. This is, this is slightly more about education and can we change the way patients come into our practices? Uh, lung cancer is difficult. Um, looking at you, you've probably, most of you had patients who've come in, uh, you've suspected it's been diagnosed and then they've died um, because they've come in too late. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow bring those patients in earlier. I am part of a study, benchmarking study, looking at how fast uh, we do our referrals and where we have access to getting uh, the diagnosis for lung cancer. And the further we get away um, from a big center, the less we're able to get fast access to the diagnostics we need. Uh, in the, this, is, you know, this is a UK-based study, but it's an international study um, uh, that I'm working on looking at that. Um, so this is the important part here. They've had the symptoms for several months. Sorry. Double question? Scratching. <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> so earlier consulting may improve survival. Um, so what they did was they took 200 uh, long-term smokers, uh, the 20 pack per uh, day um, for uh, 20 years. So they're, they're, they've got a good history of, of smoking. We have those in our practices. It's an open randomized controlled trial. Um, it's a really short intervention actually. It's a, it's a, they have a nurse in the practice who just gives one session to these patients and says, look, when you cough, come in earlier. Um, it, you know, if, if you think there's something going on, come in earlier because you may be at risk and if we get you earlier, we can cure it. And no, there's no screening test. Um, and, and so that, and then a self-help manual, which was really short as well, which was probably <coughs> lost if they're anything like my patients. Um, and then the outcomes, a little soft, but I mean, it's not lung cancer because you need more than 200 patients. You need, you know, a couple of million really to do this study. Um, consultations with target times uh, for individual with a new chest symptom, less than three days uh, for hemoptysis and less than three weeks for other symptoms. Well, three weeks, you could say, is slightly long. Um, I would want it a bit earlier. Uh, basically, it worked. Um, not well, but it did work. Um, so the consultation rate for new chest symptoms was, was higher in the intervention group by about 20%, um, but not statistically significant because it's a small sample. Um, proportion of consultations within the target time was about 10% higher. Um, again, small sample. One month after the intervention, there's a knowledge bit here. They knew what they should be doing, and that was statistically significant. So they knew that if they coughed. And the, the problem here is, although they've got 206, I can't remember off the top of my head now, but it was not that many patients who had actually had these symptoms. So they didn't, they didn't have that huge number. If they did a couple of thousand, we might have had 200 in this, and then it might have been statistically significant. Um, and, but the knowledge was there. So they knew what they should be doing, even if they hadn't had the symptoms to come and talk about. So they, it's encouragement. And for me, it's sort of, it says, okay, so that, that 30 seconds I do say to the heavy smoker, look, if you cough up blood or you have other symptoms such as a, a new cough or unusual pain or anything like that, come. And if you can't get an appointment, walk in. Um, that, that 30 seconds is probably valuable. Um, and then they're saying, yeah, they're going to do more research. But I, I thought that was just an interesting one because it's a disease when it presents late, I can't do anything about. And so if it's 30 seconds of my time and I save one life in my career giving this brief advice, that's, that's okay um, because I do no harm with it probably. So that's why I put this one in. 
Um, the, uh, I should say something about how we selected them, because I can, I have enough time. Um, so there are four of us who do this. We are all part of the organization. Uh, two aren't, two, two just volunteered. Uh, Rick Glazier and myself are part of, of the organization that does this. Um, and we just go through all the presentations. We, we tend to be, I mean, I'm a lot of the, present the actual presentations, um, and we just go, oh, that's really interesting, right. We'll have a nugget. So this is my personal opinion as a GP. Um, and it's Rick's as well, and the two other two people, Wendy, and I've forgotten, um, Dr. White, I think. Um, so, spirometry. Again, this isn't a, a phenomenal, it's going to change your career, but I see a lot of people with COPD in my practice, and I recognize that sometimes I've diagnosed them a bit late as well. And, that, and they may have had, oh, God, you've had COPD for 10 years. I haven't realized it. Um, sort of wake up, and I could have possibly done something about that. Um, it's slightly reassuring in the sense that, uh, well, I'll take you through the results. Um, I mean, this is just saying that it's a bad problem. Um, but if you do get it early, we can probably prolong life, increase function, and I still carry on talking a lot, don't I, Ian, because we, we're okay. Keep it going. Right. Um, <laughs> So this is an important problem. No problem. Okay. Um, so this is what they did. Uh, 168 US sites. Uh, each site enrolled up to 55 patients. That in itself is interesting. I just said that they got 168 sites. These are UK, uh, sorry, US practices, family practices. Some are HMOs, some are independent office practices. They, they're regionally diverse across the country, and they brought them together, and they enrolled 55 patients in each of those centers. That's actually a huge piece of organization. Uh, to have a, a trial like that and to sort it out, that, that's big. So part of the bringing this is, um, wow, they did all that. Um, so then arm one, you give a questionnaire. It's worth looking that one up. I, I had a look at it a couple of days ago before you know, going through the slides. Um, CP, COPDPS, uh, you can just Google it and download it. It's quite a nice... Um, uh, questionnaire, and you can just shove it into your office, and if you've got a, a smoker or just whatever, if you're thinking about it, um, it's quite a nice one to give to the, to the patient. So, and then they had spirometry. So that may be how they managed to enroll the sites, because if I was offered a $2,000 piece of equipment, I might like to have that. The trouble with spirometry is that you need to calibrate it rather frequently. Um, so if you're looking for spirometry, try and get one that doesn't need too much calibration. Um, we had one in the practice I was in in Montreal. Um, we had two nurses, so we were a big practice, um, seven full-time equivalents, and we could afford to practice nurses, one of whom's job was once a week calibrate the spirometry. It's difficult without that. So the second arm was uh, the questionnaire alone. The third arm was usual care. So they, were, they recruited 8,770 patients. They made 1, 000, uh, sorry, 119 new diagnoses of COPD. I was surprised at how few they made, actually. I, I think in my practice it would have been slightly more. Uh, certainly in the Montreal practice, um, where I was until a couple of years ago, uh, we had a lot more uh, respiratory disease. Um, I, so I was a, a bit surprised at that. However, this is about how good these are compared to each other. Um, and basically what it's telling us is that if you do spirometry and the questionnaire, your pickup rate is far more. Uh, they picked up 42. However, the, the questionnaire is not bad on its own, 45 new cases. But if you're just you know, waiting until someone coughs and, and um, uh, you've treated them for three different infections, in the, uh, lung infections in the last three months, and then suddenly you go, oh, maybe this isn't just acute bronchitis. Um, if you do that, then your, your pickup rate is going to be significantly less. So for me, I thought, maybe I would get that questionnaire and give it to a patient um, over the age of 55. Um, it might be worthwhile. Certainly something for us to think about. 
Um, what we don't know is if, if I do that routinely on everyone, rather like a, a pap smear or a mammogram, if I sort of structure it, this is a screening program, would that actually be effective, reduce mortality, be cost effective, etc.? I'm not sure that the evidence, well, I know the evidence isn't there from that. On the other hand, this is about us bringing you new information um, that might make you think, okay, well, at least I know there's a questionnaire there now, um, and maybe I could use it in someone I'm suspecting, uh, particularly if I don't have spirometry. Um, how many of you do have spirometry? One. There's um, uh, the PSP program. Yep. For the, um, the CSPs. Mm -hmm. And they gave us the CLP6 machine. Right. So it's limited spirometry. It's limited, isn't it? Um, how, how many of you have got those? So a few, couple. Um, I mean, it, it, it's. It's, it is interesting. I, I, I used the spirometry a lot in Montreal when we got it. Now I'm in UBC clinic, situated right in the middle of the university with no spirometry. Um, I do miss it a little bit, but I can refer quite easily to get it done. So I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm torn. But it's certainly the questionnaire I now have. Um, I think this is the last one. This is about colorectal cancer screening. And again, it's about how you might think about doing it in your practice. Um, why is it important? Same problem. If you catch it early, then you cure it. If you catch it late, you palliate. So we need to be a little bit more aggressive. I don't know what your rates are like, but when I first looked at my rates in Montreal, they were 17%. Um, so what this group did, uh, 16 Iowa Research Network practices, uh, 743, uh, so again, 16 practices is quite a significant number. That's a, that's a good trial. Um, and they had a usual care, a reminder in the chart, chart reminder and mailed education and the fit test, and then chart reminder, mailed education, fit, and a telephone reminder. Um, and here are the results. So. Um, 17.8, that's sort of my practice. Um, chart reminder, didn't really do much, 20.5. Um, if you mailed it to the patient, and most of them just sent it back, uh, it sent the fit test um, in, the, in the mail back, so that was very easy for them, um, you double it, basically, more than. Um, if you add a telephone reminder, don't bother doing that. So. Um, <laughs> Good. Um, the odds ratio is a bit boring. Um, colonoscopy, you increase the colonoscopy rates, but you wouldn't expect to increase them dramatically. I mean, it's a screening test, so that's fine. Um, uh, so, and, and yes, it increases a bit. Um, the bottom line of this one is that think about mailing it. But first, have a look at your rates. So now you've got two projects. Um, you're going to go and see what the UTI uh, resistance is like for your E. coli. And you're going to look at what your CRC rates um, are like in the practice. Um, we put in an electronic medical record into the UBC clinic, which didn't have one until I arrived, which was a bit awkward. Because uh, I, I said, having had used an electronic record since 1986, I refused to go back to writing my prescriptions by hand. Um, so we put one in, um, but in, you know, it is the press of a button. Um, th th it should be the press of a button. If it's not, I think you should be hammering your EMR provider. Um, even if you don't have an EMR, it is not difficult, because actually this should be done on everyone between the age of, say, 50 and 74. You can change you know, maybe 79, but if you're going to live for 10 years. Uh, actually, you need to do one screening to save one life. I think the number needed to screen is something like, uh, no, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, and I won't give them to you, but I think it's cost effective to do this if you've got 10 years um, of life. So maybe do it up to 80. So it's quite easy to go and get a number of charts, and, you, and because it, it should be around the 70%, 80%, um, say if you pulled 30, 40 charts, you'd know pretty accurately 
where your rates were. You wouldn't really need to do more than that. So if you've got paper charts, it's not impossible to do. Um, and if you've got a medical student from UBC, you can just give them the job to do. Um, and if you need a medical student from UBC, please ask me. <laughs> <laughs> just four weeks and we'll have answered this. And your UTI resistance, done, you see? Um, and all you have to do is give me a call and I'll give you a student. Um, so the, the organization of how you mail out the fit test might be a challenge. Um, but hey, that's what we've got divisions for. So if, if, I can't, if my rate is now 28% and I'm doing all my own reminders and I'm trying hard, but I've got six patients in an hour, why don't I go to the division and say, look, I need organization money and mail money and the fit tests, and we will just, in the Kootenays, send this out and we will be better than any other area in, U in BC, okay? But what, what are we going to use our division money for anyway? I mean, in, in Vancouver, we put posters up in, in bus stations saying, your GP is great. We, we sort of need ideas, and I think this is a great use of division money. One minute. Right. Um, so thank you to Mark Ebel, who did that, Warren McIsaac, Sarah Smith, William Waddle, and Barcelona, who did all that work. Um, any questions? <laughs>